ิดมุมมองนักบินอวกาศหญิงคนแรกของฝรั่งเศสโครงการอวกาศคุ้มค่าหรือไม่และทุกประเทศได้ประโยชน์จริงหรือ Exploitation and utilization of space must be a benefit for humankind everywhere. Competition is good for emulation, but in what is related to science, space exploration, is something that is very inspirational. That means that uh, it can give dream, desire for the young generation. สวัสดีค่ะ Global Focus วันนี้เป็นบทสัมภาษณ์พิเศษคุณโกลดีแอเยเรนักบินอวกาศหญิงชาวฝรั่งเศสประสบการณ์ของเธอนั้นมากมายค่ะเธอเป็นผู้หญิงฝรั่งเศสคนแรกที่ไปอวกาศแล้วก็เป็นนักบินอวกาศชาวยุโรปหญิงคนแรกที่ไปเยือนสถานีอวกาศนานาชาติและที่ไม่ธรรมดาก็คือเธอเป็นหมอก่อนที่จะมาเป็นนักบินอวกาศนะคะเราคุยกันหลายเรื่องค่ะอย่างเช่นว่าการลงทุนในอวกาศเป็นการลงทุนเพื่อมนุษยชาติจริงหรือเปล่าทุกประเทศได้ประโยชน์หรือว่าเฉพาะประเทศที่มีส่วนเกี่ยวข้องเท่านั้นและคุณโกรดียังมีคำแนะนำสำหรับคนที่อยากจะทำงานในแวดวงนี้ด้วยค่ะโกรดีแอเยเรเกิดและเติบโตในเมืองเลอครโซในวันที่13พฤษภาคมคศ1957โดยมีความฝันอยากเป็นนักบินอวกาศตั้งแต่เด็กแต่การที่ผู้หญิงในยุคนั้นจะเป็นนักบินอวกาศได้ดูเป็นสิ่งที่ยากเกินเอื้อมทำให้ชีวิตของเธอหันเหไปเป็นหมอกระทั่งได้รับโอกาสสำคัญในการสมัครเข้าร่วมคัดเลือกนักบินอวกาศก้าวแรกสู่ความฝันอันยิ่งใหญ่ของโกรดีเกิดขึ้นหลังจากที่เธอผ่านการคัดเลือกท่ามกลางผู้สมัครนับหมื่นคนสร้างประวัติศาสตร์เป็นผู้หญิงคนแรกของฝรั่งเศสที่ได้ออกสู่อวกาศในปี1996และได้ไปเยือนสถานีอวกาศนานาชาติเมียเพื่อทำการทดลองวิทยาศาสตร์นาน16วันด้วยความสามารถและการฝึกอันเข้มข้นทำให้ในอีก3ปีต่อมาเธอได้รับมอบหมายให้เป็นนักบินอวกาศหญิงคนแรกที่บังคับกระสวยโซยุสกลับสู่พื้นโลกก่อนจะกลายเป็นนักบินอวกาศหญิงชาวยุโรปคนแรกที่ได้เดินทางไปเยือนสถานีอวกาศนานาชาติ Thank you so much, g l a d i for joining our program. Let's start from the beginning. Have you always wanted to become a doctor and an astronaut? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, when I was 12 years old, it was in 69, I had the chance to see on TV the first human landing on the moon. And for me, it was the beginning of a dream, something that was inaccessible was on July 69, dawn. By a human, so in my imagination, grow, grow, grows this uh, uh, possibility to become an astronaut. But there was no school to mm. become an astronaut at that time, so I decided to be a medical doctor. I am a rheumatologist, and working in my hospital in Paris, I discover a call for be a candidate to become an astronaut, and for sure, for my it for for me it was obvious. So it was my path. So I asked for a file. I've been selected, and I had the privilege to become an astronaut and to have two flight missions. Wow! You were one among the seven selected. Absolutely. And the only woman to be selected mm -hmm. out of tens of thousands of um, mm -hmm. candidates. What were the qualities they were looking for at that time? Um, oh, there was a lot of. Uh, Competences and qualities that uh, was uh, uh, were important at that uh, at that time. Medical fit for sure. Psychological stability, I would say, because you, you will be part of a crew working in a complex and a style and environment. But I think what was important at that time was that I was a researcher and a medical doctor, and it was the very beginning of opening the kind of profiles to become an astronaut. No more just military, pilot, astronaut, but also researchers in order to do scientific programs in microgravity. So I think it was my asset to be a researcher in this population of pilot and military pilots. Which one is more difficult, being a doctor or an astronaut? Um, 
for both, I think we need a long training, a lot of uh, knowledge to acquire. Mm. And uh, what's important is to be curious, to learn, to learn new things in order to discover, to explore. And uh, the profile of an astronaut is to be an explorer of something that is unknown. Mm. So um, I think it was difficult. It requires a lot of uh, work, sure to feel comfortable with this new mission. Mm. But uh, the training was uh, very well done. It was in Russia at the time, in the mm. city of stars yeah, near Moscow. And we had a long training, acquiring new competencies, working all together, developing, I would say, also a, a kind of a collective intelligence with the diversity of the um, profiles in, uh, in this field of uh, being an astronaut. Mm -hmm. And after four years of training, for me it was clear, I was ready, ready, <laughs> to, ready to go and to fly. Mm -hmm. How did you prepare yourself mentally for all of these missions? Because for me, when I look from here, from Earth to space, it's a do or die mission for me. Uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of uh, things in my imagination during my childhood and uh, beginning of life. And then I discussed and extend a lot with um, cosmonauts in, uh, in Star City. Mm -hmm. That means a, a kind of diversity, also very important, is this uh, generational diversity. That means you can change with younger, with veterans of right. space flights. And... Uh, Oh, all this gave me the um, confidence in myself, in the team, on the ground, and in the, the crew members. So with that, it, it, it was okay to, to fly. But uh, I, I will say uh, sincerely to you that what I discovered during the flight was the even better and more beautiful that I had in mind uh, during my child out. Oh, I see. Now, um, you were the first French woman yeah. to go to space. Absolutely. And also the first woman mm. to command a Soyuz mm. in re-entry. Absolutely. And also the first European woman mm. to visit the International Space Station. Absolutely. So cool. Which achievements are you most proud of? Um, I'm proud to have, to have had two space missions fully accomplished with a lot of scientific results. So this is what I was looking for. And for sure, uh, I know that it's important for the young women that would like to be in engineering, in aeronautics, or in some exotic careers, I would <laughs> say, to have a, maybe not a model, but an example of uh, what is possible, how you can balance your private life and the professional life in this uh, complex uh, environment. So this role being a woman on stage for the young generation is also something important for, for me. And I think all the doors are open now. You need to have somewhere a desire, maybe a dream, mm -hmm. and to enter in the past <laughs> with boldness, I would say, in order to accomplish yourself. How do you handle it all? Work and private life? Uh, I have a um, specific situation. My husband is also an astronaut. Ah. So it's easier for sure <laughs> to cope with the situation. And we are training all together during 10 years in, in Russia. So that means it was possible to organize the, uh, this kind of, uh, of career. We had, uh, um, my husband Jean-Pierre Ignoret had two flights and I had two flights, not at the same time, but during these 10 uh, years of uh, career. And uh, you need also to be, um, to have a support, uh, I would say. And that's something important to say to the, the young um, women that would like to, to go in this kind of uh, career, uh, that uh, it's important to have around you, a circle of confidence, of friends, of family in support uh, to, to go through, through this path. But uh, with that, uh, so it, it was okay. We have a daughter and she 
is born in between two missions, but uh, no pr no specific problem. But she doesn't want to become an astronaut. Oh, no. I can't say that. Oh, why not? Uh, why not? Because maybe it's too heavy for a <laughs> young <laughs> girl to have two parents being an um, astronaut. But uh, everything is okay. ตลอดหลายทศวรรษที่ผ่านมาหลายประเทศโดยเฉพาะมหาอำนาจอย่างสหรัฐอเมริการัสเซียจีนชาติยุโรปและชาติเอเชียให้ความสำคัญกับการแข่งขันในโครงการอวกาศโดยมีองค์การอวกาศของตัวเองที่ดำเนินโครงการตั้งแต่การสำรวจค้นคว้าวิจัยไปจนถึงโครงการเพื่อผลประโยชน์และความมั่นคงในด้านต่างๆสถานีอวกาศเพื่อสนับสนุนการทางานของนักบินอวกาศถูกสร้างขึ้นในวงโครจรต่ำของโลกปัจจุบันมีสองแห่งได้แก่สถานีอวกาศนานาชาติสร้างขึ้นตั้งแต่ปี2000โดยความร่วมมือของ5องค์การอวกาศจากสหรัฐรัสเซียญี่ปุ่นยุโรปและแคนาดาและสถานีอวกาศเทียนกงของจีนที่เริ่มต้นส่งโมดูลแรกสู่อวกาศในปี2021ความก้าวหน้าจากโครงการอวกาศมากมายส่งผลต่อชีวิตของมนุษย์ในหลากหลายด้านเช่นภาคการเกษตรเทคโนโลยีสิ่งแวดล้อมและสภาพภูมิอากาศเป็นต้นแต่ในขณะเดียวกันงบประมาณมหาศาลที่ถูกทุ่มลงไปกับการแข่งขันด้านอวกาศยังเป็นคำถามถึงความคุ้มค่าเมื่อเทียบกับประโยชน์ที่ได้มาและประโยชน์นั้นมีผลต่อมนุษยชาติทั้งหมดหรือเฉพาะแค่กับประเทศร่ำรวยที่มีเงินลงทุนเท่านั้น Let's talk about the space race a bit. Mm -hmm. A lot of countries are trying to have advancement in space technology, mm -hmm. in space exploration. For example, China. It has its own international space station as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Now, is competition in the field of space healthy, or is it better for all countries to cooperate idly? Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, as a scientist and also as an astronaut, it was very important to work in this field of international cooperation. That through the International Space Station, that five partners mm -hmm. working all together, and even in this uh, difficult time now that we we live, uh, there is still cooperation on both the International Space mm -hmm. Station, on science and operation. Everything works smoothly. So that's important. But uh, you are right, the landscape is changing mm -hmm. a lot with new partners, new powers uh, being in this race. And I would say there is maybe two different fields. There is a geopolitical and economical field mm -hmm. because space is everywhere in mm -hmm. our life. And that means we need a lot of uh, satellites for connectivity, for Earth observation, for positioning. So that's very important to have innovative tools also. And for that, I think competition is a good thing because there is an emulation for the technological uh, innovation. As you see, for example, with the launcher, we have now reusable launchers. Mm -hmm. So that's something important. We, we change. There is private industries coming in the field of institutional agencies. So that's also a way to change the culture and to, to change the agility to, to work in, in that field. So a competition is good for emulation, but in what is related to science, to exploration for the future, for mm -hmm. new destination, thinking of uh, installation of bases on the moon surface, mm -hmm. which is the next step in exploration after low orbit with the space station. I think we need to think in terms of uh, Pacific multilateral cooperation. And that is the case in science, and I think that uh, a kind of science diplomacy must be there in order for us to work together in this new expansion of humankind. What's your opinion about the private sector, like Elon Musk's SpaceX, mm -hmm. playing a role in space exploration? Oh, the, the truth is that uh, this new uh, private uh, company is mm. entering in the, in the field and coming from the digital world not from the aeronautical uh, world, is something exactly. very important because it uh, it changes uh, the way to work, the agility, the propositions, the innovation that is, uh, that is done. So I think the same, it's important for this emulation in new technologies because mm. going further and further will require innovation. 
So that, that means we, we need that. Then I would say, not as a politician, but as an astronaut um, in the European Space Agency and the French Space Agency, that uh, institution has to be aware about um, general interest, what we need, common goods. Space is a common goods for okay. humankind. So that means we will need regulation, mm. we will need maybe new governance, mm. new kind of partnerships. Mm. And I think this will not come from the private industry. It will come from the institution to be uh, the guardians of uh, common goods. Mm. That's the common perception mm -hmm. that we all have about space. It's for mankind, you know, Absolutely. it's for advancement of mankind. But sometimes I think, really? Is that true? Does it benefit me or only the countries that actually invest in it? Now, th this is an important point. We have now, I think, more than 70 space agencies. So it means it's huge. In, in Thailand, you have a space uh, agency. And um, that means there is a kind of uh, dissemination of benefits, but not for all. And for me, space must be, exploitation and utilization of space must be a benefit for humankind everywhere. Um, and it's always in our mind, even thinking and exploring the moon, mm. when we will be on the surface of the moon, we will have to think in terms of energy, in terms of um, storage of uh, energy, of connectivity, mobility how to organize an ecosystem to live. And that means it will be an hostile environment. And what we will learn exploring will benefit to society. See, this is a point that we must have in mind. Always the benefits in exploration must, must have a return, the benefit uh, of Earth. And I think also space exploration is something that is very inspirational. Mm. And inspirational, that means that uh, it can give dream, desire for the young generation in order not just to look back and to say it was better yesterday. No, we have to prepare the future. So this is also a benefit of space exploration, the inspiration to find new solutions for new problems. Mm. And I, I'm really I'm inspired by that. Now, space has become more commercialized mm -hmm. and the super rich can mm -hmm. go to space as well. Mm -hmm. As a trained astronaut, mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? Uh, I am a scientist and I had two flights. Um, mm -hmm. The first one was on board the Mir station in 96. And the second one at the very beginning of International Space Station 2001. It was the very beginning, few laboratories, even it was not laboratories. Mm -hmm. So I say often that it was a kind of uh, camping science at that time. <laughs> but now it's the 21st century mm. and the International Space Station, we have a lot of laboratories, mm. Earth-like laboratories. And that means the research that we can do in microgravity mm. is absolutely fascinating. And we have no way on Earth to make disappear the gravity. So that means all the hypothesis, research problems that we mm. may have in that field, that's on space that we can do, where mm. it's a microgravity. So now we are ready to open these laboratories in a low Earth orbit to commercial enterprise, to mm. private enterprise, mm. in pharmaceutical fields, in the field of uh, agriculture, in the field of uh, new materials, a lot of discover to do in microgravity. And I think it's time now to open to co commercialization. That's something different than the tourism that you are speaking about with a space flight participant. We have discussion <laughs> in our group of astronauts. Are the astronauts or are the space flight participants? So we say that they are space flight participants. We are professional career uh, astronaut will a long, long training. But um, I think for a few of them, it can be something interesting. That's also a problem of culture, I would say. Yeah. 
uh, in space with a professional astronaut, you have pilots, scientists, engineers. So that means we are <laughs> maybe with the same mindset, <laughs> I would say. In a, and it could be interesting also to open to philosopher, to artist, to other kind of thinking about space, about exploration. But I think it will be just for some few privileged person. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will be an open field to everywhere. And I think we need to keep some mystery. <laughs> What's the mystery? <laughs> oh, the, the mystery for, for me was uh, to discover the freedom in microgravity, freedom of your body, playing with a three-dimensional <laughs> volume of space stations. This is something really uh, amazing and fascinating. Also as a scientist with the capacity uh, of adaptation to any new situation. And uh, this is something uh, interesting. Even in the medical field, things mm -hmm. that, wow, we are able to adapt our body to new situations. So maybe there is some reserve, I would say, somewhere in our body that we can extract, thinking that there is new, new possibility. And, well, for sure, looking through the window, discovering the Earth's planet, the beauty, but also the fragility mm -hmm. of this planet. Because it's the only place in the universe, everywhere around this black mystery, and there is life on this planet. This planet is our vessel, the vessel of humankind going through the solar system. And that means discovering this, what we name overview effect, looking at a distance of 400 kilometers to this uh, magnificent planet. Give us also this uh, feeling that uh, we are part of a humanity and mm. that we are responsible for the preservation of the planet, preservation of the, the atmosphere, and we, we have to uh, work hardly to explore, to discover more in order to preserve this planet A. There is no planet B. So that means for me, I'd also maybe this feeling to be a really part of humankind. I was no more a French or European astronaut. Mm. I was part of a community and I, was, and I was really part of humankind. So our next destination is Mars. Mm -hmm. How much more difficult is it to put man on Mars than man on the moon? Okay, we discovered the scale. So low Earth orbits, it means 400 kilometers. The moon is 400,000 400, kilometers and Mars is 40 million or 100 million <laughs> kilometers. It means long, long way, long mm -hmm. travel with orbitography. That means that uh, it will be six months to go there. That's about two hours to go to the space station. Uh -huh. That's about two or three days to go to the moon. It will be six months to go there. And you will be exposed to radiation. No more protection of the magnetic field on Earth. Mm. It will be a long time in microgravity. It will be far away, radiation, autonomy, because you will have a delay in communication with the ground. That means we will not be working in a team with the ground in real time. Mm. No, you will have to be uh, autonomous. And arriving on Mars, you will have to, to live, to work, to build things. So that means we are not ready now to do that, but we learn and the moon is one step in order to, to go further, to learn how to live, how to work, how to install permanent infrastructure on the, on the, on the moon in order to develop the, the field later on. I'm not sure that the young generation of astronauts will be the astronaut going to the Mars, to Mars. They will go to the moon and they will work and they will learn mm -hmm. and they will prepare the future. So that's a very, very, very young generation uh -huh. that will be the next one uh, on, uh, on Mars. But uh, the main objective to, to go to Mars 
is to try to uh, understand how this planet Mars, that was so close to the Earth's planet, with atmosphere, with water, right. millions of millions of years uh, ago, lose the atmosphere. There is no more fluid water uh, on Earth. And to understand that, because this condition of the planet Mars millions of years uh, ago maybe have allowed the possibility for a kind of life, pre-life, mm -hmm. to appear. So the objective is to find somewhere in the deep surface of Mars some traces of life. It would be a giant leap for humanity to discover that somewhere, maybe, there is traces of life. The European Space Agency has a new generation of recruits, mm -hmm. and that also includes a British Paralympic sprinter, okay. John McFall. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain how that can be a giant leap for mankind? Uh, uh, I think that's an interesting uh, step to have this uh, parastronaut uh, in, a, in the corps of uh, European astronauts. It's the first time, mm. never it has been done. Because working with him, and maybe you have seen uh, his CV, is uh, really very competent and he, he will give a lot in, in working together with the team in order to prepare safety for the future new tools also to make the interface with the machine, uh, with uh, all the technological tools uh, to, to go further. So I think it, it's really uh, interesting. And as you said also, it's a way for all these persons that have a handicap to be part of the adventure and to say, mm. I can contribute to it mm. technically, psychologically, philosophically, so that's also something important in the opening of space to everyone. What would you tell people in Thailand here, especially the younger generation, if they have big dreams like you? Uh, I think to, to be an astronaut is something that is uh, very privileged. So uh, I agree with that. We are, I think, 600 in the world to, to be uh, astronauts. But I think there is a lot to do to contribute to this um, innovative uh, exploration. That means we need researchers, we need data scientists, we need engineers, we need uh, the engineers that will do the sensors for rovers, for probes, uh, for the James Webb telescope and the <laughs> next one that, that will go. That they can be part of this uh, endeavor. And uh, as you said previously, with the private companies, the um, creation of new agencies, they can be part uh, of this uh, space conquest, quest. Um, and space is really in everyday life. So that means you need, for example, in Thailand to have uh, some satellites and you have already and you will have new satellites in order to, in the field of Earth observation, to drive new public policies for agriculture, for um, surveillance, survey of the seas and of how there is a lot of public policies that can be done with the data collected in space. And with the data collected in space also, we may be more quantitatively aware about uh, climate change. Mm. That is also something uh, very important because looking through space is also a way to have more information about climate change and maybe more prevention, anticipation of the, the next evolution of uh, climate change. So I'm sure that Thailand will grow with this aspiration to be part of this um, uh, useful space. My wish will be to meet in a, in a few, few years and Thai, Thai astronaut, maybe a Thai female astronaut, why not? <laughs> I would be proud of that. <laughs> now, being to space and coming back to Earth, does that somehow change your perspective on life? 
Yes, for sure. Uh, uh, being, being an astronaut, it's, uh, I would say, a transformational uh, experience. Yeah. Now, personally, and also because the community, uh, the general public, look at astronaut with a different glance, for sure, asking, how do you feel in microgravity? What do you see, see mm. through the window? And I think that's important, this embodiment, this incarnation of uh, adventure uh, to be shared with the public, with uh, the young generation. So um, it was my personal life before, and now I'm a um, public person. <laughs> food sales or that's something different. So it's a change. And the main change for me, I would say, that this awareness of being part of a humankind community, having to be in charge or responsible of what I mean, common goods, common goods for me, that's our planet to be preserved. And mainly for me, education of the young generation. Because I have very often the question, but which kind of planet will we leave to our young generation, our kids? And I say the reverse question. Which kind of young generation of young adults will we leave to the planet? Hmm. So education is for me something very important. And hmm. maybe have you seen that I've been a president of a, a big science museum I've been Minister for Research, so, so everywhere trying to educate to a higher level of uh, scientific literacy. And I think that's very important to have a scientific literacy because now in the social media, media or internet, you will find a lot of, of information, but you need to have a scientific approach, analysis of information in order to extract the right information and not maybe sometimes to go somewhere where it's not a solution. By the way, what's your favorite space movie? 2001 Space Odyssey. Why? Uh, it, it was at the time uh, at, uh, when I was a young uh, uh, person looking at that. And 2001. When you see this movie, that's already a future that is not <laughs> our <laughs> present. So that means, well, it, it was a dream to be part of this um, adventure. Thank you very much. Thank you. For your interview today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. เรื่องราวและมุมมองของคุณโกรดีน่าจะสร้างแรงบันดาลใจให้เราทุกคนนะคะให้เรากล้าทําตามความฝันของตัวเองไม่ต้องถึงขั้นไปอวกาศหรอกค่ะแค่ตั้งใจแล้วก็ลงมือทําแค่นั้นก็ยิ่งใหญ่แล้วค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ